that's possible, if everybody can find a seat. So welcome, everybody. It's so nice to see so many people at the business meeting. Um, so we're all very happy to see you. Um, we have the usual business to go through um, that we're required to do because we're uh, um, the council is, of course, elected, and we have all sorts of things that our statutes require us to do. So I'm going to call the meeting to order, and I'd like to call for the approval of the meeting of uh, the minutes of the meeting of the 99th annual meeting of the corporation. 24 February 2023, printed as Proceedings of the Annual Meeting of the Medieval Academy of America 2023 in Speculum 983, July 2023, pages 955 to 987. And there's a typo on the slide in that book. It should say 1980. Okay, but I, I have the, the corrected copy. Um, so I would like so I'd like to call the action, approval of the minutes. All right, thank you, Sean. Is somebody recording this? Okay. And you're gonna, you're, okay, thank you very much. Um, all in favor? All opposed? Abstentions? All right, so moved. Um, so I wanna ask, so I'm gonna ask for a motion, a second, and a vote for the, oh, no, I'm sorry, I've just done that. Lisa's given me such incredible stage directions that I'm a little ahead of myself. Um, so I'd like to present the results of the mail, mail and electoral ballots for the 2024 election of officers. So I would, the action I'd like to call for is to accept the results of the ballot. Uh, may I have, does anybody want to, thank you very much. Do I have a second? second. All right. Um, all in favor? All opposed? Abstentions? All right, one abstention, but otherwise we're all um, we're um, all in favor. Um, I would like to thank the nominating committee, um, Jessica Brantley, the chair, Daisy um, Delagu, Margaret Graves, um, Asha Kumar, Michelle Sauer, Carol Symes, and John Tolan, um, and all of the candidates who um, offered themselves up to run. I'd now like to call for the approval of the result. Have I done that already? Yes, I did. You're, you've given me too many. Uh, you've given me too many directions. Um, all right. So we now have the report of the executive director, and my um, my instructions say introduce Lisa Fagan Davis. Davis. So I will introduce Lisa. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for being here. I don't know. Uh, Megan, is everybody online? Do we have any fun? How many people are joining us online? All right. Excellent. Well, welcome, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us. Welcome to the 99th Annual Meeting of the Corporation of the Medieval Academy of America. I am so pleased that we could be here together at Notre Dame, and I do want to express my thanks to Tom Berman, Megan Hall, all of our hosts and the entire team of amazing volunteers for pulling off such an extraordinary meeting. In 2023, the Medieval Academy of America continued to support ongoing programming while adding new programs to meet current and future needs. Grants to support research, travel, and publication were expanded, and the Fellows began an initiative to fund, through donations from the Fellows, two annual Fellows Research Awards of $5,000 each, the first two of which were recently awarded and will be announced publicly during the fellows session tomorrow. We are extremely grateful to the fellows executive committee for proposing and implementing this program and to all the fellows who have donated to support it. You may remember that in 2022, the Medieval Academy received an absolutely extraordinary anonymous unrestricted gift of $150,000. That's the best kind of money lots and unrestricted. In 2023, with guidance from our new development committee chaired by Carmela Franklin, who is sitting right there, the Medieval Academy used the donation to inspire a two-year matching campaign to fund three council-driven priorities, mentoring programs, grants for medievalists working beyond the tenure track, medievalists, and centennial programming. Thanks to the generosity of our members, we surpassed our first year goal of $75,000, raising $81,345 towards the match in 2023. 
We hope to see similar results uh, in the second half of the campaign this year. You will be hearing from me uh, very soon about that. And I thank you in advance for your support. The specific programming to be funded under the auspices of the three general goals and priorities will be determined by the council when the campaign concludes at the end of 2024, at which point we can turn our attention to funding other new priorities uh, with different campaigns. The 2023 elections closed on January 3rd. I offer my congratulations to our new officers, counselors, and nominating committee members with whom I look forward to working, and my thanks as well to everyone who stood for election. In January, 11 scholars were elected to the ranks of the fellows and corresponding fellows of the Medieval Academy, and I congratulate them on this honor. New fellows in attendance this year will be formally inducted during the fellows plenary session tomorrow at 3.30 p.m. in this very room, and I hope you will join us as we honor them for their lifelong service and teaching and contributions to medieval studies. The work of the Academy could not be accomplished without the additional labor of our volunteer corps, more than 100 members working on our behalf. I'm extremely grateful to all of you for your efforts on behalf of the Medieval Academy. I would especially like to thank Robin for her leadership and hard work this year. It has been a real pleasure working with you. I also wanna add a special thank you to Treasurer Aidan Kumler, who continues to be a wise and thoughtful steward and to Speculum Editor Kate Jansen for, and her staff for continuing the long tradition of excellence in the pages of our journal. Finally, I wanna take a moment to acknowledge our counselors and committee members who are rotating out of service and to thank them for their years of work on our behalf. That includes birthday boy, Bill Monroe. So if you see Bill, wish him a happy birthday. Uh, let's see, part of our work of our volunteers includes mandated meetings, and here is the when and the where for 2023. We moved almost all of our committee meetings online a few years ago, uh, obviously first by COVID, but then to help cut down on our carbon footprint and save significant amount of money by not flying everyone everywhere for all of these meetings. The only in-person major governance meeting that we hold is the council meeting here at the annual meeting. Everything else is now um, conducted on Zoom. Uh, in terms of future meetings, this year, obviously, we are meeting here for the 2024 meeting. Next year, we'll be at Harvard for our centennial uh, for a meeting that will be co-hosted on the Harvard campus by a consortium of Boston area institutions. We do not have a meeting on uh, the a geographic home for the meeting yet in 2026. Uh, time, time is passing, so uh, I've had several people who, several institutions who were interested and then had to back out for various reasons. So if your institution is interested in hosting us in 2026, this all could be yours. So please reach out to me and I'm more than happy to speak with you about what's involved, what resources you need, what resources we provide and how we can work together to make it, um, to make it happen. As for the 2027 meeting, that will uh, be in Toronto, which is where we meet on the sevens every year. Uh, just quickly in terms of the 2025 meeting, just in case you hadn't noticed, the call for papers is in your registration packet. So please take a look at that um, and ask me or more likely Sean, who is one of the co-chairs of the meeting, um, if you have questions about it. Currently, the Medieval Academy is home to slightly more than 3,000 members. As of December 31st, 2023, we had slightly fewer. We've had new members join us since then. We were at 2,984 at the end of December. That is 91 fewer than at the same point in 2022, a loss of about 2.9%. By contrast, however, between December of 21 and December of 22, we lost 162 members or 5%. So even though we're we have lost members a little bit over the last five years, that rate of loss is slowing as we come out of the pandemic and people find themselves ready to re-engage. The renewal rate in 2023 was a very good 78.59%, but 
which is significantly higher than the renewal rates of most of our sister learned societies, and 6% higher than it was in 2022, and even higher than in 2022, 2019, returning us to pre-COVID retention levels. A deeper dive into retention levels for different member categories reveals that, as expected, renewal rates are lowest for members experience, experiencing fiscal or job precarity. Even so, we saw improvement in retention for every category as compared to 2022, and the statistics are essentially back to 2019 levels. Supporting the work of our members through awards and fellowships is, of course, one of our primary concerns. And in 2023, we awarded nearly $110,000 to 44 student contingent, junior, and independent scholars in 13 grant-making programs. In fact, there were so many recipients this year that I couldn't fit them all on one slide. There are the rest. Very, very pleased that we could support the work of these scholars. Now, we've made some changes to the annual meeting this year that I hope have been improvements. Thanks to the amazing team here at Notre Dame, all plenaries will be live streamed for the first time ever and recorded and made available online. While each annual meeting is different, different parameters, different restrictions, different of capabilities, I do hope that we will be able to continue at the very least to provide this service in the future. We've also moved all of the prize ceremonies out of this business meeting because it's so sparsely attended generally. <laughs> and we are instead presenting them throughout the conference at the plenary sessions. This will allow us to honor these prize winners, students, teachers, administrators, ECRs, and prize winning authors in a much more public way before larger audiences. Because of this, we now have time to add an open question and answer period to the business meeting. The Q&A period will take place today after the presentation of all of the annual reports. Hopefully, by the time you've listened to all the reports, many of your burning questions will already have been answered. Although the business meeting is being live streamed, hello out there, we unfortunately do not have the logistical setup to allow for taking live questions from those of you attending remotely. However, if you have questions that you would like addressed during the Q&A period, please send me an email right now at lfd at themedievalacademy.org and I will gather those questions and we will try to respond to them during the session or I can always respond to you by email afterwards. As we look to 2024 and beyond, I'm very pleased to report two decisions made by council yesterday that will impact our work going forward in what I hope are positive ways. In addition to continuing the process of reviewing the format and the logistics of the annual meeting, and I invite you please to answer the survey linked from that yellow bookmark in your registration packets, I will soon be convening an ad hoc committee to review and establish consistent guidelines for the procedures and adjudication of all eight of our book prizes. In addition, I will be conferring with executive directors of our sister ACLS societies to help me develop a formal petition procedure by which members may bring proposals to the council at its quarterly meetings. Council will consider the proposed process and get it uh, voted on and ready to go uh, at its next quarterly meeting in July. My, my 12th year as executive director, it's hard to believe, will be the Medieval Academy's 100th. As we approach this milestone, I continue to be amazed and inspired by the scholarship produced by our members and by their efforts to make medieval studies a more capacious, welcoming, and safe place for all of our colleagues. We've embraced the critical expansion of the medieval to include a more global perspective. We continue to work to make space for BIPOC and queer scholars and the important work produced in the fields of medieval critical race studies, queer studies, global medieval studies, disability studies, and more. We continue to expand our digital footprint and we understand that the attacks on the humanities throughout parts of the United States impact us and our members in significant ways that require us to rethink what it means to be a medievalist. I look forward to collaborating with you, our members, all of our constituents, and everyone in the field as we continue this important work. Thank you.
I'd like to now um, call to the podium the editor of Speculum for her annual report. Good afternoon, everyone. As I enter the last 15 months of my editorship of the journal, Speculum's primary goal is to ensure that the journal remains the gold standard publication for medieval studies in the Anglophone world. We will continue to innovate while maintaining quality, and we will prepare the way for what I hope will be a frictionless transition to a new team. Uh, let me run you through um, a few highlights uh, from this uh, past year, but before I do, um, <clears throat> I'd like to announce uh, the new, uh, editor new editorial board members. Uh, Eric Goldberg, um, Eve Krakowski, Matthew Vernon, and Benjamin Anderson. As they rotate off the editorial board, my thanks and gratitude go to Ross Brand, Stefan Esters, Cecily Hillsdale, and Cord Whitaker, each of whom made valuable uh, uh, contributions to the board. So thank you. I see one of those board members here in the audience. Um, on the review board, that is the book review board, the, uh, the uh, council has approved five new members of the review board. That's Sarah Butler, Oren Falk, Abigail Fiery, Tanya Stabler Miller, and Zita Toth. We're grateful, to, for, uh, we're grateful to Kate Heslop, Tobias Hoffman, Nicole Lopez Jansen, William North, and Hugh Thomas uh, for their service as they rotate off the board. We also welcome Tiffany Beachy and Michelle Armstrong Partita to the review board. Uh, they, they joined uh, mid-year. And now uh, for the, some of the highlights of uh, the year at Speculum. Uh, we inaugurated uh, from the editor's desk a column, a new column in the uh, January 2023 newsletter. Uh, it's a quarterly column designed to share news of upcoming articles, journal news, initiatives, and policy decisions of the editorial board. With the team from the Multicultural Middle Ages, and I see some of them over there, uh, we have created Speculum Spotlight, a new quarterly podcast. Uh, the episodes feature one Speculum article per episode, Three articles uh, beginning uh, with an interview from one of the authors in the 2023 uh, issue have now posted, and a fourth is in the works. Please listen. Anywhere you can get your, uh, anywhere you can download your podcast, these are fabulous podcasts from uh, hosted by early career scholars. Uh, we have three themed issues, special issues in the works. One of them is about to drop in April, and that's uh, Race, Race Thinking and Identity in the Global Middle Ages. Uh, it is guest edited by the team of Cord Whitaker, Nahir Otanio Gracia, and FX Fauvel. Um, the, con the contributors are overwhelmingly early research, uh, early career researchers, and these articles are the first fruits of their research. So we're very proud of the issue. We hope you find the contents uh, as interesting and as provocative as we do. We have another uh, issue in the works, and that is to celebrate the Medieval Academy's centenary in 2025. That's edited, guest edited, by Carla Mallette and Roland Bettencourt. Um, what I can say about that is though that's in the works. Those, those, uh, those articles are uh, now being revised um, and will be due in our production offices in May. 
We also have a third uh, themed issue in the works, and that's speculations, the, the speculum centennial issue. We, too, celebrate our centennial in, 20, it's in 2026. Uh, as you know, I hope you know that, that uh, the call for papers generated over 220 proposals. The editorial collective uh, comprising Peggy McCracken, Mohamed Balan, Cecily Hillsdale, Sierra, Sierra Lamuto, and um, myself, uh, we've made the, that initial cut. So those who we are inviting to submit articles have been uh, informed of the editorial decisions. Moving on, uh, I am proud to announce that Speculum won five article awards this year uh, in different fields. Um, uh, just, I'll try to go through them quickly, but I uh, want to give credit where credit is due. That's uh, Petros Boros Valianatas, Valianatos, Cross-Cultural Transfer of Medical Knowledge in the Medieval Mediterranean. Uh, his article won uh, the J. Worth Estes Prize from the American Association uh, for the History of Medicine. Mary Harvey Doigno, Roman Women, Female Religious, the Papacy and a Growing Dominican Order, was the runner up for the Hagiography Society Article Prize. Elizabeth Papp Kamali, Tales of the Living Dead, Dealing with Doubt in Medieval English Law, was the winner of the Sutherland Prize from the American Society of, uh, for Legal Hist History. Peter Lowen's article, uh, Rudder for the Ship of Fools, Bosch's Franciscans as Jongleurs of God, won the H. Colin Slim Award from the American Musicological Society. And Adam Franklin Lyons and Marie Kelleher, Framing Mediterranean Famine, Food Crisis in 14th Century Barcelona, was the winner of the Bishko Memorial uh, Prize from the uh, Association of Spanish and Portuguese Historical Studies. So if that doesn't show some multidisciplinarity, I don't know what does. Um, so my gratitude and thanks go first of all to our fantastic set staff who are scattered through this audience. Um, that's Taylor McCall, Carol Anderson, Jane Mashew, Dave Wilton, Jennifer Ottman, and Lola Lestraps, along with our editorial interns. Chris Cole and Cheryl Mullane Corvey in the Boston office, the members of the editorial and review boards are contributors, peer and book reviewers, the team at the, at the uh, University of Chicago Press, the officers and councils, uh, counselors of the Medieval Academy of America, the provost, Aaron Dominguez, and the associate provost, Ralph Albano, uh, and my colleagues at the Catholic University of America. Uh, uh, Catholic University of America. And finally, if I may be permitted a word in the animated conversation about the configuration of the future editorship of the journal, being fully aware that this is not my remit, nonetheless, I do have uh, a some historical insight and present experience to offer to the discussion. I promise I will be brief. Uh, having dug around in the archival foundation documents pertaining to Speculum and the Medieval Academy of America, so that is the minutes of meetings, committee reports, newspaper articles, and letters of the founders, what I have found is revealing particularly in light of the present discussion that we, were that we are having about the future of the journal. I have time only to note one of many things that I've found, um, and that is that the Medieval Latin Studies Committee, out of which both Speculum and uh, the uh, MAA grew, which was a standing committee of the ACLS, then, then under the direction of Charles Homer Haskins, their top priority was the establishment of a journal dedicated to medieval studies. A subcommittee was established for that purpose on January, in January 2024, and six months later, the committee agreed that they needed $6,000 100,000 in today's money to fund the journal for one year. 
John Nicholas Brown did that, helped them to do that, um, and became the first publishing editor. But the founders further stipulated that a $100,000 endowment that today is 1.75 uh, million should be raised for the journal. So that's there in our foundation documents in 1924. So I haven't yet been able to follow the money trail further than 25, but those foundation documents make it clear that the founders intended the journal to have an endowment. And our current contracts with uh, University of Chicago Press and CUA ensure that Speculum is uh, not only profitable, but a prime contributor to the MAA budget. But to have a fully funded journal with a competitively salaried benefits eligible editor or team of editors, as the Speculum uh, Board has uh, suggested, uh, and a fully salaried and benefits eligible staff, it's necessary to have an endowment as the founders understood. So therefore, on the journals or on the eve of the journal's centenary, I stand with the founders and those arguing for an endowment, and I certainly would urge the council to put the journal front and center in its deliberations about priorities for funding and fundraising. And doing so will ensure the health and future of the journal as it enters into its second centenary of, or its second century of publication. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kay. I'd now like to call um, Kay Ryerson up, who is going to be reading the Treasurer Report on behalf of Aidan Kumler. Thank you. Um, I am replacing Lucy Pick, who was supposed to read this report, and she caught COVID. So, you know, so it goes. This is Aidan Kumler's report. The Medieval Academy of America ended 2023 with a budgetary surplus of $37,054. If one recalls that only in 2020, the MAA, the Medieval Academy, got free of a structural deficit that had lasted almost 20 years, the surplus with which the, the Academy closed 2023 is certainly to be celebrated. So too, the year to end return on the MAA's invested fund in 2023 was 13.67% net of fees. Uh, and the end year valuation of the Academy's investment portfolio was $8,665,385. Although the value of the MAA's invested funds made a welcome recovery uh, by the end of 2023, it should be noted that the portfolio's value is still below the 2020 and 2021 levels. The Academy's liquidity position, we call it the liquidity bucket, implemented in 2020 has enabled the MAA to avoid locking in losses during periods of dramatic volatility in 2023. Although the liquidity position inevitably creates a drag on ROI, return on investment, during bull markets, it has proved quite effective in protecting the academy during periods of volatility and market downturns over the last three years. As membership continues to contract, a growing proportion of our members do not have the job security provided by tenured academic positions, and many medievalists do their scholarly work outside of the professional track. It seems almost certain that membership dues and donations, two of the MAA's revenue streams, will continue to diminish in the future. The state, this state of affairs means that the Academy's invested funds and the income generated by Speculum 
will increasingly be the major sources of revenue that enable the MAA to work with and on behalf of medievalists and medieval studies. To maintain the Academy's fragile financial health into its second century, we must do all that we can to safeguard our invested funds, increase philanthropic support, to retain members as effectively as possible, and to attract new members. Simultaneously, the MAA must do whatever can be done to reduce operating expenses without compromising its ability to energetically and creatively fulfill its mission. With these financial considerations in mind, uh, in 2023, Council approved a proposal from the Finance Committee in consultation with the Executive Director to close the MAA Boston office in 2025. Since the COVID-19 pandemic, Academy staff have continued to do the bulk of their work from home. The Boston office has during this time served as a necessary space for the receipt and shipping of books submitted for review and speculum. Giving up the Boston office will result in estimated future cost savings of more than $50,000 a year. This decision has already necessitated considerable work on the part of the executive director and Boston staff to reconfigure the day-to-day -day operations of the academy and to begin the process of emptying the office. Further, closing the Boston office will require publishers to send books to the review directly to be reviewed directly to reviewers, a project that the current editor of Speculum began to pursue in 2023. Starting in 2025, the funds formally dedicated to rent in past budgets should be available to be spent on other purposes and or trimmed from the budget. A further major step toward reforming the Academy's expenditure on operating expenses taken in 2023 focused on restructuring the benefits package offered to Medieval Academy full-time staff. Prompted by a major increase in the cost of healthcare benefits and guided by the practices of peer organizations and institutions, Council decided to restructure the health benefits package offered to full-time employees. Before 2023, the MAA had paid 100% of the cost of health insurance for all full-time employees who use this benefit. According to the restructured benefits package, the Academy pays 80% of the cost of health insurance and benefit ed eligible employees will be responsible for 20% of the cost of their health benefit. Bequest donations and annual giving also play a role in the Medieval Academy's finances. In 2023, the fellows of the Medieval Academy generally create, generously created and funded the Fellows Research Awards, two new annual grants of $5,000 each. Also in 2023, thanks to a major anonymous and unrestricted gift, the Academy launched a, quote, matching challenge, unquote, that will continue in 2024. With every donation matched by the anonymous gift up to 150,000, uh, the matching challenge seeks to increase the Academy's support for three priorities set by Council. Mentoring programs, grants for medievalists working beyond the tenure track, and programming for the Academy's centennial year. Thanks to the hard work of the Development Committee and the Executive Director, the matching challenge was launched quite effectively. Donations to the challenge in 2023 amounted to $81,345. The result of the first year of the matching challenge is heartening. All those who donated to the challenge deserve great thanks for their generosity and their collaboration in strengthening the MAA's ability to fulfill its mission as it looks ahead to its second century of activity. 
Among the financial matters confronting the Medieval Academy in 2023, the future of speculum was a, was a major topic. Following the decision of the current editor of Speculum not to seek a second term, it became clear that a new editor of the journal must be sought in 2024. Since 2019, the editor of Speculum has not been an employee of the Academy, and the editorial operation of Speculum has no longer been run out of the MAA's Boston office. This arrangement has resulted in both cost savings to the MAA and required new forms of budgetary expenditure on the journal. Although the editorship of Speculum is intellectually autonomous from the operation of the MAA as a whole, Speculum remains an integral component of the MAA's financial operation. The Academy makes quite significant investments in Speculum and the journal represents an important source of income for the MAA. To get a bit further into the weeds of Speculum's role in the Academy's finances, in the 2023 budget, the income generated by Speculum in form of contractually stipulated royalties paid by the University of Chicago Press an estimated JSTOR royalties was 222965 As noted above, since July 2019, the editor of Speculum has not been an employee of the MAA. Compensation for doing the hard work of editing the journal has come in the form of course releases from the editor's employee, uh, in this case, Catholic University of America, supplemented by the MAA's contribution of one month summer salary and fringe benefits, as well as funding to cover the editor's speculum related travel. Apart from these contributions directly supporting the editor, the MAA financially supports the operation of the journal in other ways, including contributing to the contribution to the compensation rather for a, a managing editor position created in 2021, paying the salary as well as FICA Medicare contributions of an associate editor, originally a postdoc position, compensating a part-time editorial assistant and paying for proofreading services. MAA expenditure on speculum in the 2023 budget totaled uh, 115,394. And I understand there'd be some adjustment to that um, from Lisa's calculations. Additionally, the University of Chicago Press contributed $47,965 earmarked for editorial support in 2023. Returning to the financial big picture, the Academy's expenditure on speculum represented 12.6% of the total budgeted expenditure in 2023. Net the MAA's expenditure on speculum, the journal generated 107,571 of revenue for the Academy, which is 11.6% of the Academy's total budgeted revenue in 2023. That revenue combined with the allowed annual draw upon the MAA's invested funds and smaller sources of income, for example, from the sale of Medieval Academy books, pays for the day-to-day -day operation of the MAA, as well as for all MAA activities and initiatives other than endowed prizes and fellowships. In other words, the income generated by Speculum is part of how the MAA finances its work on behalf of its members and uh, medieval studies. Uh, it, the income generated essentially uh, goes into operating expenses. Since 2019, when the editorship of Speculum ceased to be a paid and benefits eligible position on the MAA's balance sheet, the Academy has freed itself from a serious, nearly 20 year long structural deficit, and thus has been able to fund a series of ambitious new products, projects, and initiatives, including the new Centennial Grants, 
the pilot phase of a mentoring program, the creation of new prizes and research awards, recognizing and supporting scholarship that contributes to diversity and inclusion in the field of medieval studies, uh, new travel grants for medievalists with doctorates who are not in full-time faculty positions, and new digital outreach efforts. A number of factors contributed to this major transformation on the MAA's financial situation. Among them, the reconfiguration of the editorship and the editorial operation of Speculum played an important role. The search for a new editor will necessarily require the Academy to revisit and renegotiate how, to what extent, with what aims it plans expenditure on Speculum over the next five-year editorial term, 2025 to 2030. Given the import of Speculum generated revenue for the Medieval Academy's finances, it is important that Speculum remain, remain well supported by the MAA. At the same time, any increased expenditure on Speculum will require careful deliberation and hard choices. The intellectual benefit that Speculum offers medievalists cannot be reduced to dollars and cents, nor can it be overstated in other terms. By financially supporting Speculum, the MAA continues to sustain the Journal of Record for Medieval Studies. It offers an important forum for both senior and rising scholars to share the fruits of their research and analysis. It makes critical contributions in the form of book reviews Speculum publishes, and it supports the journal's important role as an ambassador to medieval studies in a global intellectual landscape. Publishing Speculum is central to the MAA's mission, and it is also a crucial integral part of the MAA's financial picture. To increase the financial investment the Academy makes in Speculum would necessitate far-reaching reallocation of funds. Although Council is empowered to undertake such serious reconfiguration of the budget, it must be emphasized that much current expenditure is entailed and cannot be directed uh, to other purposes. For example, numerous prizes and fellowships awarded each year by the MAA. Significantly increasing in expenditure on Speculum, as would be required to revert to having the editor of Speculum be a compensated benefit eligible employee of the Medieval Academy would be possible only if council reallocates the monies saved by the closing of the Boston office, monies available uh, in 2025 at the earliest, reduces Speculum staffing costs and or drastically reduces or eliminates expenditure on other academy activities. Alternatively, philanthropic support could be sought to endow the speculum editorship, roughly estimated full endowment of the cost of the editorship would run to several million dollars. Finally, it is within council's powers to significantly increase the allowed draw on the MAA's invested funds so as to cover the cost of the editor's salary and fringe benefits. As treasurer, Adam Kumler states in the strongest possible terms that this final option is not a viable or responsible way forward. Increasing the allowed draw on invested funds must be avoided at all costs. If the Medieval Academy of America is to support all medievalists and medieval studies in the decades and century to come, the Academy must do all it can to safeguard and grow its invested funds. For the reasons briefly given above, the Academy's invested funds are the only secure guarantor of the Medieval Academy's future existence as an organization, of Speculum's uh, future, 
and of the future support of medievalist and medieval studies more broadly. The MAA's invested funds exist for one purpose only, to enable the Academy to fulfill its mission now and in future. Given all that we know and can reasonably anticipate about the future facing medieval studies and medievalists, the Academy must exercise prudence in how it stewards its invested funds. A financial resource that should be put to work for the benefit of medievalists and medieval studies today, the Academy's invested funds are also a resource held in trust for future generations of medievalists and for the future of medieval studies. And this is submitted respectfully by Adam Kumler, the treasurer of the Medieval Academy. Thank you. Um, so I've just been told to announce that we're going to be here until 2.15. Um, so we're going to keep the, uh, the meeting going so we can uh, get through all the reports and have time for questions. Um, so I'd like to call um, the chair of um, Cara up next. Uh, knowing that we're running behind, or uh, running considerably behind schedule, uh, I'm going to truncate my report just in the understanding that this full report is going to be published in Speculum and everybody can see it there. So I'm uh, just going to mention real quickly, uh, there you can read more about the events that we sponsored over the last year, including the CARA plenary, the CARA meeting, uh, our meetings at Kalamazoo, our prizes and all the other, uh, what should we call it, the details. Um, so I'm going to jump ahead to the, to the conclusion of our report, uh, just sort of looking forward. As another year begins, the CARA committee remains committed to its original purpose which is to support the work of department centers and regional associations engaged in research and teaching about the Middle Ages. CARA also aspires to work more productively with organizations within and outside of the Medieval Academy that share CARA's fundamental goals, building stronger communities of medievalists, encouraging our constituent groups to empower and expand medieval studies in North America and beyond, advocating for the critical work done by our members and promoting the teaching of the Middle Ages not only at colleges and universities, but in elementary, middle, and high school, as well as, as well as within our society at large. To this end, CARA must forge stronger and more productive relationships with the MAA's K-12 and graduate student committees, as well as the Teaching Association for Medieval Studies, or TEAMS. Despite their value, however, these institutional collaborations are not enough. As the Medieval Academy enters its second century, CARA's leadership, and its member organizations will need to engage more productively and proactively with all medievalists in our communities, particularly those working on the margins or outside of academia. Making our networks and scholarly resources more open, available, and welcoming is essential to the growth and indeed the survival of medieval studies. As the number of tenured and tenure track positions in our field continues to decline, the energy, talent, and wisdom of colleagues from every walk of life are resources that we cannot afford to dismiss or overlook. CARA can and should play a central role in this creative reimagining of the field, including creating durable research consortia between so-called lone medievalists and larger medieval studies centers and institutions, advocating for the best practices that were laid out by the MAA's Ad Hoc Committee on Professional Diversity, and helping departments, centers, and associations to support one another and benefit from the untapped potential of medievalists new and old. We also must find ways to support those who will continue our work in the coming generations. Over the past years, I have been alarmed by the increasing numbers of graduate students seeking CARA support for training in medieval languages, manuscript studies, and other technical fields training that once was readily available at many institutions, but now is rare or non-existent, even at supposedly elite universities due to retirements, program cuts, and disinvestment. Without more funding from CARA itself, from institutions of higher education, or from other sources, it soon will become impossible for a new generation of scholars 
to develop the skills necessary for the kind of cosmopolitan comparative medieval studies to which so many of us aspire. Despite these challenges, I end my term as CARA chair in a spirit of honest, if guarded optimism, buoyed by the goodwill, enthusiasm, and collaborative spirit of our many members, as well as our outstanding executive committee. I'm delighted that Professor Lauren Mancia will be assuming the CARA chairmanship for the next three years, and that her place on the committee will be filled by an outstanding young historian from the University of Nebraska, Carolyn Twomey. Finally, and probably most importantly, I'm thankful to all of you for supporting and sustaining CARA, an organization with a rich history and a bright future, and one that I was honored to lead. Thank you. I'd next like to call to the podium uh, the, um, Will Beatty. Good afternoon. In the interest of time, I'm also going to try and cut our report a little bit where I can. But uh, the Graduate Student Committee is pleased to report on our progress over the last year in our main areas of programming, which are mentoring, our newsletter, conference events, and online engagement. Our mentoring program connects graduate students with established scholars based on research and professional needs and interests at the annual meeting, ICMS Kalamazoo, and IMC Leeds. This year, we connected about 168 uh, graduates and, and faculty as mentors and mentees. In some areas, like the MAA, this was a slight increase, particularly in the mentee numbers. In others, Kalamazoo and Leeds, we saw a slight decrease. We also introduced uh, in 2022 a new summer mentoring scheme, which we continued into 2023. And we're looking at ways to bring in more participation and increase the engagement between graduates and uh, senior faculty at all the major conferences. We continue to distribute quarterly issues of the GSE's newsletter, which provides conference and timely announcements about upcoming events or deadlines, as well as short articles uh, on interesting work being done by graduates, by junior faculty or independent scholars. In 2023 to 24, we took the opportunity to look back to the archives and reprint one article per issue on some of our older material, which we still thought would be relevant, whether that be preparing for leads or finding ways to present your dissertation research uh, through new online portals. We're continually looking for submissions on uh, short articles and new pieces by graduate students about a variety of topics. And this year, uh, GSC member Masha Golden and myself took charge of the newsletter. Through our Twitter and our Facebook accounts, the GSC shares calls for papers, funding opportunities, workshops, MMA announce, MAA announcements, forgive me, and helps other medievalist organizations to publicize events. Our digital reach continues to grow. Our Twitter following is currently about 1,445 followers, and our Facebook is growing from uh, to, uh, to about 3,208 followers. Lauren Lee and Maria Thomas managed the GSC's Twitter and Facebook accounts this year, and we're always looking for ways to expand our outreach. For the 2023 annual meeting, the GSC organized the roundtable International Research in Libraries, Archives and Museums roundtable discussion. Uh, speakers included Adam Cohen, Alina Gertzman, Julie A. Harris, and Kirsty Francis, and we're incredibly grateful to them all. GSC members Reed Omar and myself organized that session, and we also hosted a graduate student social bar at Cure Bar uh, in the Grand Hyatt Hotel. The social was very, very well attended. The panel was immediately the next morning at 8.30. Not quite so well attended. <laughs> we still don't know why. Um, that same year, 2023, we also organized a mentoring lunch in collaboration with the Inclusivity and Diversity Committee. Uh, this allowed graduate students and established professionals to socialize in a relaxed setting. Participants were invited to chat about a variety of topics, including research, teaching, the job market, and it was very well attended. We're also going to be replicating that on Saturday as a breakfast this time, and we're working on that with Rachel Vaz of the IDC. At Kalamazoo, the GSC organized two related hybrid workshops in 2023, both called Careers Beyond the Academy. The first, sort of subtitled First Steps, dealt with a range of topics related to looking for and transitioning into different career paths as a medievalist. And the second, which was called the First Draft, 
looked at resumes, cover letters, and interviews. The sessions were organized by Maggie Heeshan, Mackenzie Sullivan, Kirsty Francis, and Anne Lay. And a well-attended graduate student reception and trivia contest was also held as well. And it was also at Kalamazoo that the GSC organized, uh, sorry, held its annual business meeting. At IMC Leeds, GSC member Maria Thomas organized a virtual roundtable session, the International Medievalist Perceptions on Research, Teaching, and Networking in the Age of Globalization. Here we sought to facilitate greater connection with medievalists beyond Europe and North America and discuss some of the challenges that can arise for scholars operating in different geographical spaces. The panelists were Montezir Ali, Elizabeth Liendo, and Uslan Erin. Due to rising costs of registration for Leeds, the GSC chose to use the funds to support registration for panelists in that particular year. This year, we've also continued to organize a series of successful online workshops. The MAA has generously committed $1,600 in support of these programs for three years, beginning in 2023 to 24. The goal of these workshops is to provide tools and advice for graduates who are navigating the many different challenges of funding. And as you heard from the CAR report, we're looking at new ways to collaborate with them to find different kinds of programs we can offer for graduates to give them that support they may not find elsewhere. We've hosted two workshops so far this year, organizing your research and accessing libraries and archives around the world. We'll be hosting a third called Grant Writing, a conversation with recipients in April. And we'll be hosting a fourth workshop tentatively titled Medieval Studies for Underrepresented Medievalists later in the academic year. Recordings of all of these events will be available or are available on the MAA's YouTube page. In addition, in January, we hosted our second Digital Humanities Showcase in which we promote and discuss the work of medievalists who are using digital technologies in new ways. We've learned a lot from these workshops and at our business meeting at Kalamazoo, we'll carefully reflect on how we can improve these, uh, these different sessions and structure them better for, for uh, greater accessibility and graduate engagement. And we thank the MAA for their financial support. Finally, the Multicultural Middle Ages, uh, which is our podcast, it began in the GSC, but later in 2023, the decision was made to uh, make it its own entity within the MAA. It continues to work closely with the GSC, however. Just as when it was launched, the podcast is an open forum and an invitation for medievalists to produce culturally responsible content to educate experts and non-experts alike on the global history and culture of the Middle Ages. The podcast, as we've already heard, is collaborating with Speculum in regular Speculum Spotlight episodes. So again, please do go and have a listen. Um, it's a joy to work with Speculum and we're really excited about the work we're putting out. And so to conclude, it's been an absolute privilege and a joy working on behalf of the Medieval Academy of America and its graduate student members. We've achieved many of our goals this year and there's much more that we hope to do. We're constantly reviewing our work and adapting to post-pandemic professional environments. For more information about the GSC and the services we provide, please visit our page on the MAA's website. Thank you again to the MAA for generously supporting graduate students. Thank you. Thank you very much, Will. Um, Will will actually be defending his uh, dissertation next week. So let's wish him luck. Um, I'd now like to call um, to the podium the delegate to the American Council of Learned Societies. Do you, are you going to plug in your computer? Okay. Good afternoon. I believe I'm the last report. So in the interest of time, I've truncated um, my report today. You can read the full uh, report in Speculum. The American Council of Learned Societies is nearing the end of its current strategic priorities period that spanned the last four years from 2020 to 2024. These were COVID-19 pandemic years, which clearly affected the response to the priorities. President Joyce Connolly's 2023 address was a reiteration of the priorities and a discussion of the initiatives set in place to achieve the goals. There are four major priorities of the ACLS, but two of them were most obvious at the meeting. The first was to, quote, support scholar, scholarship and scholars uh, responsive to the needs and interests of diverse, diverse audiences, unquote. This broad goal had many active parts, but the highest priority was supporting outstanding scholars in conditions of precarity. 
Historically, black colleges and universities, HBCUs, figured largely at the meeting. While President Connolly stated that the ACLS was nonpartisan, nevertheless, there were growing politically inflected challenges in the US to academic freedom that particularly affect HBCUs, institutions that despite being underfunded, continually overperform. A plenary-like roundtable and two concurrent panels, uh, divisive concepts in HBCUs, building relationships focused on these issues. I attended the later panel because I was curious to see how the Medieval Academy of America and its members might network with this underrepresented body of scholars and teachers. The ACLS has new grants aimed at faculty of HBCUs, which at the time of writing this report have been granted for 2024. No medieval topics were present. Other faculty and students fell under the rubric of scholars and conditions of precarity, including underemployed graduate students, many still affected by the pandemic, faculty working heavy teaching loads, but able to both research and engage undergraduates, underrepresented and first generation scholars. Again, many of the grant and scholarship competitions are aimed at supporting these scholars. In her presidential address, President Connolly likened the current state of the ACLS to the modern sculptures of Anthony Caro, works of twisted metal exhibiting dynamic tension and balance and innovatively resting not on pedestals, but directly on the ground. This dialectic was the guiding theme for the address. On the one hand, President Connolly resisted the vocabulary of decline, crisis or emergency in the humanities, preferring to focus on advances, including the growth of research in understudied areas such as disability studies and indigenous studies, deeply interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary programs aimed at undergraduates and public humanities programs. That said, she mentioned the losses of students to STEM and business related fields and the concerning reduction of tenure tracked positions. Another note of dynamic tension in the humanities was between traditional scholarship and innovative research. The ACLS prioritizes programs um, that stress change, progress, and critical responses to the present state of the academy and the world. The ACLS is deft at pivoting monies and energies to meet immediate contemporary challenges or to progress humanistic studies in emergent fields, of which the ACLS Emerging Voices Fellowship and the ACLS Digital Justice Grant are just two examples. However, using the analogy of Carol's sculptures that rest on the ground, President Connolly likened curiosity-driven scholarship and highly specialized research to the grounded aspect of Carroll's sculptures with the rest of the sculpt structure flowing dynamically from it. Yet she, she stated, we should continue to ask ourselves, what is research? What are we training graduate students to do? And who are we researching for? A striking anecdote of the address was how in the Library of Congress, there are thousands of works of research, but fewer than 40 works investigating research itself. A reminder to turn, to turn our finely honed critical lenses on our own practices and not to react, quote, as though asking questions is a negative attack. As in the previous report, I was curious about the place of, mediev of, the, of the Medieval Academy of America and Medieval Studies within an ACLS that tries to balance traditional and innovative scholarship. Looking over the competitions and by my count, 14 medieval projects successfully completed, uh, competed rather for grants and fellowships up significantly from last year when only four medieval projects were represented. Notably, all the projects are on East Asian topics in the medieval period. The ACLS has strong funding in Asian and Buddhist projects, so this is no surprise, although I have no data on the number of medieval studies projects outside East Asia that applied for support, these numbers suggest that medievalists need to advocate more convincingly for funding projects that encompass the global nature of our scholarship. The values of the ACLS coincide with the scholarly activities of our members. We are publicly engaged with an active online and social media presence that is alert to urgent issues in the present that rely on a knowledge of the Middle Ages to fully comprehend. Our scholars investigate underrepresented histories in Europe and across the global Middle Ages, but we are also champions of curiosity-driven and highly specialized research that could be supported by programs like the Summer Institute for the Study of East and Central, East, Central and Southeastern Europe. 
I look forward to attending the next ACLS meeting to deepen our networks, to argue our case, and represent the dynamic and diverse nature of our society as your delegate. Thank you. Thank you, Aphrodisia. Um, I'm now going to open up the, um, the floor to questions. And would, would Lisa and Sarah like to come up? Maybe or I get, okay, no, okay. I'll open up the questions. All right. Yes, Laura. Hello, my name is Laura Moriali, the independent scholar, and I'm here to really open up the space for questions about the recent advertisement of the um, specular, uh, the, the editor of Speculum as a non-paid position. And I just want to acknowledge that this is a topic that has created some anxiety among people and a little bit of apprehension. But I just want to say that um, that's kind of a great thing. That means that we have something that we all care about and we all want to talk about. So I'm very thankful to leadership for, for um, being willing to discuss what this question looks like and some of the hard you know, choices that we're going to have today. So I'm not going to speak anymore except to say that there were a group of people who expressed concern about this on two, for two reasons. First, for the sustainability of Speculum and its continued excellence. And then secondly, in terms of the messaging that came across by saying that this is an unpaid position. And as an independent scholar, trying to convince people that my work is uh, worth, worth money, um, this is not a good message to me personally, but I think that everyone has a feeling about um, doing work in an unpaid way. So I'm just gonna open this space for other people who I know also have comments on that, so thank you. Other comments? Please feel free to stand up. Raise your hand, yes. Yeah, Mark and I just wanted to sort of support what Laura said about um, both, I think, the, the, the wonderful work the Academy has done, recognizing the precarity of a lot of our members, and that in some ways then looking for an unpaid editor position kind of flies in the face of uh, this incredible move that the Academy has made to sort of open it up in the last you know, decade or so. Um, and I guess the other thing I would say is that I think increasingly, depending on R1 universities to support journals in their ranks, um, is, is going to be less and less possible. Um, you know, I'm at the University of Texas at Austin. We've had a number of editors um, among my faculty. Um, we now ask the journals to pay to buy out their journals. So it's no longer a degree. It actually costs the journals money. So we, this is a, a long-term trend, and I think we need to recognize that um, we're going to have to pay somehow or another. Other, but yes, please. I'm from a original Franklin, and I am thankful for what has been said about Speculum, uh, both by the editors and the financial report. I mean, I would say the editor of Kate, Jensen, whose name was not announced. Oh, uh, I'm sure that you know, sorry. Uh, yeah. We all know it is. Uh, but also the discussion of speculative finance uh, committee report. And as somebody who has raised money for the Geneva Academy and other institutions, I think that it's very misguided of the council not to have put the matter of speculum on their to-do list from the time this new pattern was developed. In the old days, in the very, since I was a young scholar and joined the academy, um, the, the, uh, the executive director was also the editor of Speculum. The first person I knew who had that job was the great Paul Meyer, who became a great mentor to me, in fact, a reader for my dissertation. So, you know, the, that model changed when the decision was made to split the position into two because um, the uh, executive directors said that they could not simply do that job. And, and I can understand that. But since then, we have not developed carefully a new model. And that means to me that Speculum has, has not been a priority for the Council. 
I don't know. I mean, after this happened after I left, uh, I finished my job as, as uh, the president of the academy. However, if that is the case, then they need to do that right away and to assure the membership of, of the medieval academy. The speculum is not a problem, but is a worthy, the worthiest part of the academy, I think, that really needs to be supported and um, its future assured. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, Jean. <clears throat> Hi, I uh, just have a couple of remarks. One of them is, uh, Going forward, and that's where I, want, where I hope that everyone is looking, uh, we need to assess what the likelihood is that uh, a journal can be supported outside the, the organization. And that needs to be a very clear headed, practical risk assessment as well as a hope. Because uh, down the road, we don't, we don't want to be here um, five or ten years from now and say, gosh, I wish we had an endowment. And by the way, by my calculation, to underwrite the cost, do I need to turn this off? No, 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 no. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> by my estimation, uh, uh, the journal could be well funded for $5.5 million for an endowment. 5.5, and that might do it. I, uh, I would want to know uh, all of the expenses before calculating at 4.5% of income over here. And so that means that uh, someone is going to have to make this a priority. Uh, and I just want to say, we referred to uh, John Carter Brown, was it? Or John Nicholas Brown. John Nicholas Brown, thank you. Wrong Brown, right? John Carter Brown was John Carter Brown was the same family. Carter John Carter Brown was the richest uh, individual in the United States as an infant because of the deaths in his family. But John Nicholas Brown did fund the initial. That's right. That's right. But if you look, if you look at some of the some of the correspondence around it, he offered that as a challenge. He said, "I'm giving this." in the hope that other members who want to support medieval studies will come up and meet a challenge. And I think that that's something that we all need to consider. Uh, thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'm um, Nicholas Watson. I'm speaking as the current president of the Fellows um, to report from the Fellows business meeting which took part, part place um, last Friday. Um, the Fellows are an honorary society and have no business interfering in the affairs of the Academy and we're not um, thinking we should do that. We're also a group of committed medieval Academy members um, and the sense of the meeting under any other business was that um, I should bring to this meeting um, first the affirmation that the, the speculum is and has always been and should always be central to the medieval academy's operations, and second, that um, an endowment uh, that an endowment is something that we should aspire to, and that many fellows would be interested in contributing to the building of such an endowment, and that this would be a wonderful thing to come out of this current discussion. Thank you very much. Questions or comments? Words of wisdom? Suggestions? Um, Connie. Well, first, first Connie and then um, Sarah. Uh, this is related but not directly related. Uh, we didn't hear anything about publications other than Speculum. And as the exponent knows, the Academy continuing to publish <laughs> yeah, that was my fault because I was trying. I, I was trying to keep my my report shorter than than usual, so I didn't mention that. But yes, of course, we publish books through Medieval Academy Books and the University of Toronto Press. We published a very big book last year 
um, and um, I think there's at least one in the pipeline. I encourage anyone who would like to publish with us to look at our website where you will see exactly what to do to submit manuscripts for publication. We also publish uh, online open access editions of Latin texts through the Digital Latin Library. Um, that, those, that those are our, our primary other um, publication um, programs. So, Sarah. Hi, I'm Sarah Lipton. Um, on the annotated program, I was supposed to give a few remarks about my plans for the future year. They were scribbled on a notepad, so you can see they didn't rise to the level of plans. Um, I just wanted to share two things, is that the first item on my ideas for the coming year was to ask the council to vote on establishing an endowment fund for Speculum. So that will be asked for, and that will happen. Um, while continuing to help scholars and teachers who want to get to archives, libraries, landscapes, locations to do so, help those who cannot tra travel for various family location accessibility reasons to reach sources that they need without having to travel, um, help graduate students get the skills they need. I want to set up a program whereby we offer um, summer online six-week language paleography programs. If you have a language in mind you need, email me, email Lisa Fagan Davis. And the last and most important item, and the reason I came up here so that Robin didn't have to do it herself, is to please, my main plan for the immediate future is to attend and invite you all to attend Robin's plenary address, which will be co-authored authored for the first time in presidential history, I think, by Sam Leggett of Edinburgh University. It will be entitled Rethinking Grand Narratives, Mobility, Diet, and Health in a Small Corner of Early Medieval Hampshire. It takes place 10.30 on Saturday morning in this room. Thank you. Can I? Um, uh, so, um, I, I, I just want to say, so thank you so much for all of your input and also for attending here. I think the Medieval Academy has a lot on its plate next year. Um, I am sure that the July meeting, which I will happily not be attending because I'm going to ride off into the sunset, will put as a first priority talking about uh, establishing, establishing some kind of fund that makes sure that Speculum has a history. So, so I would just add to all of that, that, that establishing and raising money to endow the editorship is absolutely something that we should be doing. I agree with that 100%. That doesn't get us where we need to be for next January, however, when we need to have a new editor. And so I, I want to make everyone understand the, a little bit, just a little bit, I know everybody's got sessions to go to, about the current situation, which is that we do, in fact, have money that we use to support the journal. It doesn't pay for the editor because she is funded through course release, but it does pay the, uh, the staff of the journal that support the work of the journal, and they are an incredible team. And so it, it is possible with some creativity that someone who was not bringing with them uh, an institution behind them, it is possible that we might be able to take those funds and think about how we could reallocate them to support an editor. But it also then, we have to find money to support the staff because this is not a one woman job. I think everybody, that's clear to everyone by now that this is not a job that can be done without significant staff support. So I welcome anyone who is interested in this, get in touch with me and let's talk about how maybe we can figure out a way to make it work. I would love to be able to open this up so that we could hire absolutely the, the, the best person, no matter what the circumstances, um, as we did this last time around. So um, we are going to have an open, um, another open forum online at the end of May for anyone who's interested in talking about the position and the, the future of the editorial staff. So uh, watch out for announcements of that and, and let's talk. Let's keep the conversation going. Uh, and now off to the next sessions. Thank you all very, very much. Mm -hmm.